Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. So I want to introduce to you probably one of the most unknown saints. He happens to be my favorite saint. So I hope maybe after this presentation, he may also be one of your favorite saints. His name is Arnold Johnson. He's the founder of the Society of the Divine Word. One of the most fundamental characteristics was his awareness in the abiding grace of God, that God was ever present to him. And this was led him to be open to the spirit. However, maybe some personalities are born saints. I think we could honestly say Father Arnold was not born a saint. He was perhaps in the process of becoming a saint, but he had many limitations and personal weaknesses, and he had to work very, very hard to acknowledge his many limitations. And even if Father Arnold ignored those limitations, he was reminded time and time again by those who surrounded him of his rough character and difficult personality. Again, Father Arnold's growth was not marked by any special conversion. He challenged the early German church to do more for the missions. In fact, he urged a, a, that a German mission house should be opened. However, Father Arnold never planned to be the founder himself. He seen himself as the middleman. He thought through the promotion of a magazine that he had produced and fundraising that he could help instigate the opening of this mission house. But in his wildest dreams, he never thought that he would be a founder. When he did realize eventually that perhaps God was asking him to be the founder, he responded with generosity and trust, though with hesitation. At the time, the German church was going through a crisis under Bismarck. Bismarck pers persecuted the Catholic Church. So this was the context of the founding of our society. Arnold Johnson gets to know the apostleship of prayer and travels widely to prepare this to, throughout the diocese. He became more and more aware of the needs throughout the world. He leaves Bohol since 1873 and becomes the rector of the Ursuline Convent in Kempfen. And so he rose awareness about the mission of the Universal Church through the publication of the Little Messenger of the Sacred Heart throughout the diocese and to lay people also. So Arnold Johnson was lamenting to so many people about the needs of the Universal Church and why don't we have a mission house. And it was Bishop Raimundi who came home from Hong Kong on vacation Bishop Raimundi looked at him and perhaps seen something in Father Arnold that no one else had seen. And he said to him, why don't you do it? And this struck him deeply. In Holland, because of the Kultur camp, again the persecution, Father Arnold, because there was no way he could open it in Germany. So what did he do? He crossed the river mass. He bought this old stable. Downstairs just feed the horses as the farmers came with the products to brought, brought them to the barges on the river mass for transportation to Rotterdam. And upstairs was where the farmers would sleep overnight while they stayed over. His intention was to get the German speaking Catholics involved in the worldwide mission. And this led him to the founding of the first German speaking mission house in Europe. Arnold Johnson found St. Michael's in Steyl, the first German Dutch mission house. It's a very modest beginning. What was fundamental in the opening of the mission house were the local people. They provided on the day of the opening chairs, tables, spoons, forks, everything that was necessary. He had nothing. Not only did they chip in, but when the more people gathered around him and listened to the vision of this man, the more they wanted to help him. These were the first inhabitants of St. Michael's in Steyr. This was a young diocesan priest that came from Austria. Father Joseph became the first missionary to China. China became the first mission country and he was sent in 1879. 
Father Joseph gave himself completely to China. He never was to come home. This is after 15 years, Steyl began to become, become a village unto itself. Not only were the seminary built, the church was built, but also workshops began to spring up all over. Why was this so important? Because sending people to the missions, they had absolutely nothing. So container after container was going with the missionaries, filled with stained glass windows, with materials for building churches, altars, statues, everything. And so Steyl became a village. There was nothing, all these workshops and religious brothers who belonged to the Society of the Divine World were doing all this wonderful artwork and sending it to the missions. One of the first printing presses ever was set up. Again, many of our young brothers ran the printing press and Father Arnold, that word of God, that God's word may be made known and spread, he thought we have to use mass media. And very early on, he got into having printing presses in many of our mission countries. This is the magazine. He was printing Stadtgottes, the city of God, and again, spreading the word of the mission. Many people began to help him fundraising through this magazine. Father Arnold, in 1882, founded the first missionary sister congregation to join us in the mission, knowing that for orphanages, for schools, for health, that women can go and have access where men will never have. And so he founded a second congregation of the Holy Spirit Missionary Sisters. These are the first sisters that departed for Argentina. Again, 1892, they kept, the numbers kept building and growing. And then he opened a church in Steyl. This is the upper church, we call it, for retreats and recollections and opened it. He had great appreciation of lay people. These were the part of the altars, statues, that container after container was going to our mission countries wherever we opened. He had this sense that we cannot do God's mission if we don't really know who God is. And so Father Arnold, moved by the Spirit, opened a third congregation and are the Holy Spirit Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. They dedicate their life to prayer 24-7 before the Blessed Sacrament. They are praying for the mission. Father Arnold opened churches in Germany, in Austria, in different countries in Europe. This was the first Sacred Heart Convent of the, the Mother House of the Missionary Sisters in Steyl in 1904. He got into Anthropos because again, he realized for missionaries, we cannot be going out to the mission if we don't know how human beings behave. He would have the maps down and he'd be meticulous that he wanted to know all the details, the language, the culture, the food, what motivates them, the religion, everything. So our first mission was China. In Africa, our first mission was in Togo. And again, it was thanks to the help of the lay people and people who through their fundraising and also sending their sons and daughters and many young sisters, many young priests who could not work, could not evangelize in Germany, came to the mission house and it kept us expanding. What was the purpose? That God may be glorified in everything. Father Arnold's vision was that we must go where God is not yet known. In January 1909, Father Arnold died. His legacy, three worldwide international religious congregations. 1875, the Society of the Divine Word were known as SVD. In 1889, Servants of the Holy Spirit Missionary Sisters, our Adoration Sisters, in 1896. By the year of Father Arnold Jansen's death in 1909, 1,500 sisters, brothers and priests lived and worked in the Netherlands, China, Italy, Argentina, Austria, 
Germany, Brazil, Togo, Papua New Guinea, the USA, Chile, Japan and the Philippines. What Father Arnold Johnson began in style continues today. Worldwide we are today 6,000 priests and brothers in 85 countries around the world. We're 4,000 missionary sisters also in the missions around the world and 400 adoration sisters popularly known as the pink sisters we have countless committed lay people and friends who support our mission around the world and who if it wasn't for them we wouldn't have begun at all father arnold had huge appreciation for them what is it all for for the proclamation of the good news of jesus christ for justice and peace for dialogue between peoples cultures and religions for the liberation of people from poverty and oppression in africa oceania asia pacific in europe americas in the whole world that has to be updated to 85 countries i have titled this gently prudently courageously the story of the Society of Divine Words mission to black communities of uh, Mississippi and the Gulf Coast. And I'm going to come back later and talk about why gently, prudently, courageously. Um, but I want to start with, you know, two years ago, uh, my wife and I bought a house here on the corner of Ruella and North 2nd, right across the street from Father Mike Summers. And um, little did I know about the history of this place or the remarkable history of its role in the state and the Gulf South and Catholics as well as the black communities. You know, it is amazing to think about German missionaries in a very strange country and a culture, really a world apart. And just a couple of examples you've heard earlier about the long, the wonderful history that started in style in the Netherlands, but uh, with, with the Society of the Divine Word start. But um, again, thinking about sharecroppers, thinking about the Delta of Mississippi, uh, that whole world, this is a picture of some of the first um, uh, missionaries who came over. They came in through Pennsylvania originally. This is a picture early days in the 1890s. I think this is 1896 of them. And of course, uh, I think everybody is familiar with, you know, the, you know the, just the difficulties and poverty that how did the Society of Divine Word, these German missionaries, come to Mississippi um, how did they determine that they wanted to do a, develop a, a mission in particular to black communities in the United States? This, this area, Marigold, actually started as a German uh, settlement. But that failed. His property ultimately was worked by members of the black community in that area, lived on the property, sharecropped it. Um, priest by the name of Father Aloysius Hike, who's in this picture to the left with um, some of the uh, students and he got he caught malaria. Um, he wrote about his loneliness and frustration during that first month. Um, yellow fever outbreak, which delayed the arrival of the sisters, missionary sisters who were there to, who were going to come to teach at the school. Um, and despite all of that, in a couple of months, starts school. The school is very quickly popular. They have up to fifty kids to start, um, but began also immediately to be um, beset with what you might expect. Um, opposition, public opposition to a black school, for, a school for black children, um, and really the rise in violence and the rise in a segregated society. 1895 to 1925. Um, in 1895, the um, Plessy versus Ferguson U.S. Supreme Court rules effectively that segregated separate but equal society is legal. And the, the public opposition, this is a quote from the governor of the state of Mississippi during this time that the, the missions were being built, as well as uh, he became U.S. Senator uh, Vardaman, J.K. Vardaman. Just, and I read it to emphasize the culture and the challenge of the time. Education is a positive unkindness that renders the Negro unfit for the work which the white man has prescribed him and which he will be forced to perform. And if it is necessary, every Negro in the state will be lynched. It will be done to maintain white supremacy. That we talk about 
violent fear, courage. This is the world they've walked into, right? Their first mission has lasted less than three months, a run out, violently run out of town. Um, Father Jansen is writing to Father Hike. Father Hike was the missionary priest I showed in the picture who had escaped for his life. Father Jansen, off in style Germany, is writing a letter and says, prospects surely do not look good, and my counselors, his counselors, do not want to have anything more to do with the black mission. In spite of that, I do not want to make that decision. It often happens that something succeeds, even though the majority think the whole effort is hopeless. And in the same letter he wrote to Hike, he said, proceed with, he proceed with that with gently, prudently, and courageously. They proceed. And they quickly establish the first mission at Vicksburg in 1906. Um, there's a picture here of the original St. Mary's School and Parish House there on the left. Um, a picture of Father Hike, who was the first mission missionary priest at Vicksburg, um, and with some of his parish in 1908. And then uh, there's a series of missions across the state of Mississippi, first in Jackson at Holy Ghost Church uh, in 1908. Um, in 1910, they open up St. Joseph's in Meridian. They also open up a parish in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, St. Bartholomew, and then in 1913, the Sacred Heart uh, Church, Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Greenville. So this is not just a story of Bay St. Louis, right? This is a story of um, black communities in Mississippi and Catholicism, but it's also goes beyond that. It goes to schools. Father, um, Father Mike earlier talked about the mission, missionary sisters, the Holy Spirit missionary sisters. The divine word missionaries established the first schools as part of these missions, mission churches, schools were critical. They established standards that challenged public schools in Mississippi. Um, and across those schools by 1920, this is only 15 years later after being run out of Marigold, they had a thousand students enrolled across Mississippi schools. Um, and they would establish the first high schools for black children uh, and ultimately teach tens of thousands of uh, students across the state of Mississippi over the coming uh, several decades. They had this tremendous success building schools, but they had a lot less success getting families to actually join the church. Um, Protestant, black Protestant churches had their own pastors. They had their own leadership. They didn't have se segregated seating because they were there. They had their own churches. The society was great at building schools, but less successful again, bringing in uh, black uh, uh, folks into their churches. Um, and they became convinced as a result that they needed and had to have you know, black priests and leadership to, to be successful in truly uh, welcoming and engaging, you know, the community. They were able to ultimately uh, establish a uh, seminary at first at Greenville, uh, at the Sac uh, Sacred Heart College in Greenville in 1920. Uh, and in 1922, they agreed to move uh, the church, or the seminary, I'm sorry, here to Bay St. Louis, um, they laid the first cornerstone for construction in, in 1922 and, of course, uh, opened it in 1923. Um, it's described in detail in the House Chronicle, which is a wonderful document that uh, was shared with me. And I just will read it for you real quick. Today is marked as a red letter day in the annals of St. Augustine's Mission House, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. It's, it was the day of dedication of this new mission house and the history of the Catholic Church among the black people of America. The day of the opening of the portal, portals of the first seminary for young men of their race with a vocation for the priesthood. A day that will long be remembered particularly by the hundreds of visiting Knights of Peter Claver and thousands of black Catholics from New Orleans and other points along the coast visiting this day as an epic making forward step and as a pledge of their most hearty endorsement of the great enterprise, a grand parade was formed and they marched through the business section of the town and then to the seminary grounds. So you can imagine a parade of thousands 
Pope Pius XI also recognized the event, wrote um, a, a letter that was read at the event, it, and it said, which is quote here, it is a source of deep joy to learn that the College for the Education of Negroes who have displayed virtues so splendid that they sealed their faith with their blood. And does it follow, does it not follow that every people should have priests who are one with it in race and character? In 1924, uh, the, Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit Missionary Sisters, who we've talked about before, came to St. Uh, Bay St. Louis, came to um, St. Rose School, and ran that school until um, they left in 1995, was the last uh, year that the sisters were here. St. Rosalima intimately tied here to St. Augustine as well. And, and we have the seminary um, established in 1923 here. And in 1934, the first um, black priests in the United States um, were, uh, were ordained. Um, you might think that this was pretty straightforward, but you can read the house um, notes in particular from Father Matthew Christman, who was the true first founder in the sense of um, you know, education leader of the seminary. He wrote in a, a history that with few laudable and noteworthy exceptions among the clergy, even priests as a body were either indifferent or directly hostile to our undertaking. The students here worked the grounds, they did all the work, the labor, the, the, the food, you can imagine what it took to, to run. Um, financial support from places like um, Catherine Drexel, the Bishop of Natchez, and eventually these four uh, men, Maurice Rousseff, Francis Wade, Anthony Bouge, and Vincent Smith were ordained and again celebrated with thousands of people, another major event for um, in 1934 that attended um, their their ordination. I would like to say that the ordination is the e is done and it's the easy part, but yet another challenge. 1934, you still have segregated societies, uh, a segregated culture, and where are these new priests going to go to work? Where, what parishes can they be placed in? And they found in this case, finally, a supporter in Lafayette, Louisiana, Diocese of Lafayette, um, Bishop Jules Jean Mard, um, Lafayette happens to have the largest, um, one of the largest black Catholic populations. There were 50,000 black Catholics in Lafayette Parish. That's almost a fifth of all black Catholics at the time in the United States. So um, Bishop Jean Mard uh, set up uh, a church called um, uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary Church, which is an SVD church today. The next major cultural change was Brown versus Board of Education, which was the first uh, U.S. Supreme Court ruling that uh, establishing that separate but equal schools were not legal and putting and effectively ending legal segregation. That triggers a whole nother con you know, convulsion of violence. And um, in 1958, uh, Father Gerald Lewis, whose pictures here, the story made the um, the New York Times and other national news, um, he was actually prevented um, from entering the parish church. This was a mission church called St. Cecilia. Um, if you're not familiar with St. Bernard Parish, it was um, the home of Leander Perez, a notorious um, uh, uh, segregationist. Um, he uh, spun up significant opposition, not only here, but in the desegregation of the schools, uh, to a point where he was ultimately excommunicated by, um, uh, by the church. Um, in this case, causing, uh, really rousing up opposition to Father Lewis coming to serve Mass, he actually comes to the church and the parishioners and the, the sheriffs and the parish are standing there that prevent him from entering. Um, Father uh, Archbishop Rommel of New Orleans shuts down the parish, never reopens the parish, um, and ultimately that parish is actually destroyed by a hurricane. But you see the, the challenge, the, the example, the courage, the character that these priests show through these years, these difficult, different transitions in our history and in civil rights. Um, and then lastly, we'll end with that lasting legacy. You think about St. Augustine, it trained... Um, 165 black priests in the United States by the time it closed in 1968. 
Um, the first bishop, African-American bishop from the United States was Joseph Bowers. He was actually named the Bishop of Accra, which is in Africa. Um, he was trained here, ordained here. And then Harold R. Perry, whose picture is here, was the first um, African-American um, bishop in the United States. He was named Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese uh, of New Orleans in 1966. Um, and Father Perry is, I think, a pretty remarkable man. Uh, in addition to being the first African-American bishop, he was also the first black member of any clergy to say the opening prayers for Congress. Um, he was a consultant to President Kennedy and President Johnson during the civil rights period of the 1960s um, and also served as provincial superior here uh, for the southern uh, province, um, which is what Father Mike does. Um, so a remarkable, I think, legacy when you think about this, and I just would close personally, you know, it's, it's an honor and it's emotional to read stories about this and the courage uh, and the bravery and the faith it takes um, people to do these things, whether as priests, whether as community members, um, you know, to, to truly have to face um, hatred and, uh, and violence. Uh, while doing God's mission and loving all those around you. Um, and so in celebrating the 100-year anniversary this year, I think it's, it's, it's critical we celebrate the seminary, but I also think that this seminary as a place, as a touchstone, is critical to, its, its, uh, you know, to maintaining it because without the physical, tangible place, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know what it is or learn about these remarkable people um, uh, that have made such a difference, you know, in our society. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, thank you all for the opportunity to share with you, I think, this remarkable story.